Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Melanie Dunchy, the Assistant Dean for Library Services here at Duke Law, and I'm really glad to welcome you all to this event. Um, this is Open Access Week, which is a global event now in its 10th year, focused on academic and research communities continuing to learn more about the benefits of open access in research and scholarship and to inspire wider participation. So it's particularly fitting that we will be hearing today from Jamie Boyle and Jennifer Jenkins, our colleagues and the authors of Theft, the History of Music and Leaders in Thought about Open Access uh, Materials. So Jamie and Jennifer have sternly instructed me that they hate long introductions. So I will say only what they told me I could say. Uh, you know, we, they are very proud to work here at Duke. They teach intellectual property, music copyright, trademark law, and seminars on the public domain and free speech. Together, they are the co-authors of this comic book and its predecessor, Bound by Law, as well as an intellectual property casebook now in its third edition. You or anyone can download all these books for free under Creative Commons licenses. Or you can buy your personal copy after the event out in the hallway as well. Individually, they have written many books and articles on the intersection between copyright law and the internet. And now we will hear about this, their latest work, this mammoth graphic novel about the history of music, musical borrowing. And I just finally want to end by thanking Belfer Smith for designing the poster and helping to arrange uh, the many details of this event and also to Sue Hicks and for, to the Office of the Dean for co-sponsoring this event. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Thanks to the Dean's Office. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, I have a few more thank yous uh, to make before we begin. Um, one of our biggest thank yous goes to Professor Anthony Kelly, who's backbenching it all the way back there. <laughs> Professor Kelly is a distinguished uh, musician composer in the Duke Music Department. And let's just say that um, there would be many more errors in this book were it not for he. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thanks also go to Balfour Smith, who uh, individually wrangled every single digital image in this entire book. And remember, this is a 250-page book. Uh, Balfour was absolutely uh, fabulous. Um, we also uh, we have many other thanks, great research assistants over the years. Um, we'd like to thank the Ford Foundations, the Rockefeller Foundations, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, who supported this work. It's been a long, long journey. So um, we first of all thought we would, should start with like explaining what this thing is. And um, I asked my children what I should, how I should do this, and they said, Dad, you need a YouTube video. <laughs> so I have a YouTube video in which you will find that I am the narrator, and I apparently believe that the best way to narrate a YouTube video is to do a phone sex call. Hi, this is the Center for the Public Domain. What intellectual property rights are you wearing? So, Jennifer, take it away. Theft, a history of music. A 2,000 year journey through time and space. Our comic tells the story of music's history from Plato to rap music. And because we care about that history being accessible to everyone, we're making it available for free. To understand music, you have to understand its technologies, from notation to the sample deck. Each new technology disrupts the past, changing the music in the process. But this isn't just a story of technological change. To study music is to realize how it builds on itself. For centuries, musicians and composers have been borrowing from each other. Church musicians and troubadours, classical composers, jazz improvisations, the Delta blues, the rockers who fused blues and country to make rock and roll, hip hop, this is a story of cross-fertilization of culture. And during this whole history, that borrowing has been both celebrated and resisted. It has been resisted for philosophical reasons. Plato wanted the state to ban the mixing of the musical modes. It has been resisted for religious reasons. The 
Holy Roman Empire wanted to standardize the mass. They used the first real musical technology, notation, to try and do so, with unpredictable results. It has been resisted as part of an attempt to police lines of racial culture. Jazz and rock and roll provoked frankly racist responses before their fusion of cultures and styles enriched American music forever. And finally, borrowing is increasingly resisted for legal reasons. Ironically, right now, clearly illegal copying, the downloading of whole songs without permission, is flourishing. Yet the artist who merely seeks to quote a tiny snippet of another tune, or to be influenced by a groove, or to solo around a pre-existing melody, will find that process very tightly regulated. Yet these are all freedoms the musicians of the past took for granted. Would we get the great musical genres of the past, jazz, the blues, rock and roll, if they had to play by today's rules? Our comic tries to give you the answer. Buy it or download it for free. So that tells the basic story of what we were doing. Um, we thought it was better than a little PowerPoint summary at the beginning. But the question is, why a comic book? And that's what we'd, uh, what we'd like to turn to now. Because I think for many of our colleagues, um, the comic book is proof that tenure is a very dangerous thing. And it was probably <laughs> granted erroneously, at least in my case. So I have, we have, I think, a defense of ourselves for that. So you are probably wondering to yourselves, why a comic book? First, with the video, I wanted to thank Miguel Bordo, who is brilliant, and uh, he made that video for us. Why a comic book? Making scholarship accessible. This is our second comic book. Our first comic book was called Bound by Law. And Bound by Law was about fair use and the permissions culture in the digital age. The idea that one has to get permission and pay a fee for every fragment of another work, no matter how small. We wrote Bound by Law with our dear departed colleague, Keith Aoki, who tragically died while we were um, writing this book with him. And we dedicated the new comic book to Keith. Our goal with both of these comics was to translate scholarship into public discourse. We thought that a comic might appeal to some audiences, not those in this room perhaps, more than a law review article or even an op-ed. We aimed Bound by Law at maybe a few thousand film students, documentary filmmakers, law students. It's been downloaded more than a million times. So the internet has made intellectual property fair use everyone's business. And there's a need for this kind of public education, it seems. But we were serious about the idea that it was scholarship we wanted to chronicle, not vague cliches. So this new comic book we're going to talk about today is, perhaps sadly, the result of seven years of research, yeah, um, which included one of our favorite parts, a course we co-taught with Professor Anthony Kelly, who is the inspiration for the coolest character in the comic book, way cooler than our two characters. Um, we taught a course that was half PhD composition students from the music department and half law students. So talk about cross-fertilization. It was great. And um, a lot of our research grew out of that course. We want everyone to have access to this public education as well. So if you go to the website for our book, you can find a page including uh, further reading with lots of fascinating books, and I highly recommend those to you. But being lawyers, we also have comic footnotes. Yeah, they're not in the comic book itself because it would have been 400 pages, but they are online. So if you go to any page in the comic, so this spread is our six degrees of inspiration, which took forever to put together. But we managed to link Handel to Beethoven to Brahms to Mahler to Berio to Stravinsky with all sorts of that's the actual music um, that we're talking about. So this is page 52. If you go to our website, you can click on a thumbnail for page 52, and that'll take you to our beta version of comic footnotes. Clicking on each of those links will take you to the actual page in Google Books where available or in law review articles where you can find a reference 
for every claim that we make in the book. So for those of you who like footnotes, rather, you can supplement your reading with um, that. So this book is already being used in not just law school courses, but also in graduate music courses. And we're delighted about that, but we'd love to take it further. We want to get it into high school honors programs that are already facing uh, funding cuts um, into community colleges, into the homes of music lovers. And to make the book accessible, it's under a Creative Commons license. That means that anyone can download the book for free. You can share it. You can excerpt it. You can put it in your course materials. Permission has already been granted. Our belief is that if you talk the talk, Melanie mentioned open access, you should walk the walk. So we make all of our stuff available online in multiple versions for free. I got Jerry to come along with that. I'm still working on the rest of these guys. Triumph, <laughs> triumph. <laughs> so to answer the question, why did you guys write a comic book in seven years doing it? Because we wanted scholarship to be accessible and free. But also for another reason. So the medium is the message. Marshall McLuhan, presumably he appears at this point and says, you've entirely misunderstood my work. They say that um, writing about music is like dancing about architecture, so presumably this comic book is pictures of dancing about architecture. Um, that seems a little strange. Why do it that way? Um, one idea was that the, um, the art form actually mirrors the message of the comic. This is remix in the service of writing about remix. So whether we're referring to Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, for those of you who are Bosch lovers, to Archie and Veronica, to the classic Stan Lee, uh, Jack Kirby uh, superhero comics, uh, to Freud, sometimes a doolang is only a doolang, um, or to Doctor Who. Um, in each case, we were trying to show that shared culture is only shared if you can actually refer to it. And in a further nice piece of recursivity, um, we were trying to say that the, our use of these images, some of them copyrighted images, some of them copyrighted characters, are actually exercises in the freedoms we're discussing. We do this in a face of a tendency for copyright law to extend over ever finer pieces of culture. The Ninth Circuit has actually held that the Batmobile is a copyrightable character. The judge was obviously a Batman fancier and it has well, all of the uh, sections of the opinion are preceded by Batman quotes. Um, the Batmobile is a character that is copyrightable. The car, right? right? Just, just want to stress that here. So the point that we were making is that what we do here is actually exercising the legal freedoms to refer to your own culture to talk about people who exercise the legal freedoms to refer to their own culture. Um, it's almost like one of those Escher staircases. Oh, yes, we borrowed that one also. So how did you write the comic book? I mentioned the research that we did, but we actually also did the graphic design for the book. And in fact, we're happy to say that some other law professors have been inspired to write their own comic books. So professors Manavi Sundar and Anupam Chandler, Chandler at UC Davis um, wrote a comic book about Fred Korematsu for the post 9-11 world. Some of you might conceivably be interested in writing your own comic books. Comic book about low income bankruptcy protection or the earned income tax credit or gun control post Heller or the laws of war. We would be delighted to see more comic books. But you might also be interested in learning how we put this together. So here is our process illustrated by a single page. So our national anthem's in the news a lot these days. You may have noticed that if you aren't on Mars. Um, this, was, this is the typical storyboard we have for a single page. You'll see descriptions of the text on the right-hand side, um, images sometimes uh, showing our artists what we wanted on there, um, the idea we had here, the cannon from the British ship is going to fire a cannonball, et cetera, et cetera, and that's going to move forward here. What were we trying to do? Well, um, let's hear the Star Spangled Banner. And besides, I'll instruct you, like me to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's vine. 
So um, you may have noticed the first clip you heard there is not the Star Spangled Banner. It is the tune that Francis Scott Key stole in order to put the Star Spangled Banner to it. You're not only rebellious colonists, you're pirates. <laughs> you people steal other people's music. Someone tell the US trade representative. So um, that was the Anacreontic uh, song. It was a drinking song from 1787. Um, which uh, Francis Scott, he'd already written the words to the Star Spangled Banner. He set those words to that tune, which is when it became, um, when it's when it became popular. Um, and then you heard Jimi Hendrix right at the end there uh, saying, if this is the national anthem, it's my national anthem too. And I'm going to make that point by playing it in a way which will both shock and perhaps outrage some of you. How to express all of that's already taken me about four or five minutes in a single page. Well, so we uh, lay out all of this stuff here. We send it to our wonderful illustrators uh, and inkers, Ian Aiken and Brian Garvey. They produce a pencil sketch of what I and Jennifer have laid out. Here you can see the cannonball arriving, turning into a crystal ball, showing the anacreontic song. There's the beginning of the, and that's the right number of stars, I believe, um, actual. Star Spangled Banner turning into the butterfly. This was Puccini actually used the Star Spangled Banner to refer to Pinkerton, the detective, uh, in Madame Butterfly. Uh, and then you see that morphing all of the way to the distinctive shape of a Fender Stratocaster and to Jimi Hendrix, which becomes the final inked version, which looks like that. That took about three weeks. And there's 250 pages, so do the math. Um, this is why it took rather a long time to do the book. Um, so, bad news. Um, the US national anthem is actually purloined. But at least you have my country tis of thee. My country tis of thee. Actually, that is set to the tune of God Save the Queen, his <laughs> national anthem. <laughs> There's a pattern here. Um, <laughs> how about the Battle Hymn of the Republic? Taken from Canaan's Happy Shore, which became John Brown's body, Julia Ward Howe, the abolitionist, wrote the words, only to have a British folk song collector claim the copyright. Cecil Sharp, mine eyes have seen the glory of the stealing of my words. Um, how about um, the uh, Marine Hymn? An old Spanish folk song, and also possibly an Offenbach opera. So, Remix isn't America's future. Remix isn't what goes on on YouTube. Remix is America's past. And that page, one page, tried to say that by doing it. So the medium is the message, but what's the message? As the video told you, the book tells us the history of music, particularly the history of musical borrowing um, from Plato to rap. The first thing that we find is that music is different. It is special of the arts, of all of the arts, I think. Music arouses the deepest fears, the deepest re emotional reactions, the deepest and strongest kind of pulse. Think of the time when your music, when you were a teenager, was the only thing that mattered nearly as much to you as the person you had an unrequited crush on in high school, right? Remember that moment where like, you had to share your music with your friends to show that you were, in fact, friends? Music has those kinds of barriers. And that's been going on for a long time. Again and again through history, people have tried to prevent musical cross-fertilization. They've tried to draw lines, barriers, to stop musical borrowing. Here are two early examples. The first is Plato, the second, the Holy Roman Empire. So Plato saw music as a quasi-mathematical expression of the deep order of the cosmos. But he also saw it as something that could short-circuit reason to jump the firewall of rational thought and speak directly 
to the passions. So as a result, he wanted music regulated by the city state. This is from the Republic. Music and gymnastic must be preserved in their original form and no innovation made. Any musical innovation is full of danger to the whole state and should be prohibited. Where does it end? Gross immorality, social unrest, fornication, even dancing. The fear was of the effect of remixed music on moral fiber and on governance. In Plato's case, this meant not mixing the musical modes, for example, the Dorian, the Phrygian, the Lydian modes there, each of which was thought to inspire different emotions. One inspires a bacchic frenzy, one is more appropriate for a warlike temper. The goal was control. State regulation was the means of control. But the issue had nothing to do with property rights, copyright law, what many of you are learning here. Um, it had to do with control of the ethos. By contrast, the Holy Roman Empire had a different set of priorities. So um, the Holy Roman Empire built its legitimacy partly on its connection to religious orthodoxy. Uh, Pippin III, my, my favorite, I think, of the Pippins, uh, except perhaps Cock is orange Pippin. Uh, Pepin le Bref, as he was called, Pippin the Short. Um, he got the Pope to bless him as king of the Franks by promising to maintain a unified orthodox religion. Um, that meant a mandated version of the liturgy, but it also meant a single version of sacred music playing in every cathedral in every corner of the empire. How to induce that kind of uniformity? Well, first, this is actually true. They had the Scola Cantorum, the Pope's uh, choir, who would go to every um, go to every cathedral and say, this is the way you're supposed to sing it. That's kind of inefficient, right? Um, the idea was it had to be plain chant. Right? It had to be only the human voice. Instruments just detract from the true joy of God. It had to be monophonic, no polyphonic melodies, right? And it had to be only certain tunes, only done in certain ways. Not a particularly efficient way to do it. And so around this same time, notation is gradually being rediscovered. Notation was had been discovered uh, way back in Babylon, again in the ancient Greeks, that it was relational, not absolute, and now is being rediscovered. Um, and the church realizes that this seems like the perfect technology of control. They can specify this is what you must sing and nothing else, and notation spreads across the Holy Roman Empire. Later, this is accelerated much later in the, with the printing press. But of course, what does notation do? Well, the first thing it allows is it allows people to construct complex polyphonic melodies, right? Lots of instruments playing at the same time with all kinds of cool harmonies. Oh, did I mention instruments? That's not the human voice. A technology of control turns out to have unpredictable results. You should tell the Recording Industry Association of America this would not stop with the Holy Roman Empire. One of the stories in the comic is that we are very, very bad at predicting the results of technologies, both of freedom and of control. So um, this is a, an even more um, developed one after the development of the printing press. You can now see just how complex this is. This guy actually got a patent on printing all um, music in Venice uh, because of his ability to print this, again, claiming it would help uh, religious orthodoxy. Um, so <clears throat> the development of the printing press only accelerates it. But uh, sadly, we, uh, we're probably going to have to cut short at least part of the history here. So we could go on and on for hours. Um, you may notice we're only sort of in the late 1400s and early um, 1500s <laughs> here. So um, we could talk about the continued borrowing from the secular to the sacred and back again. We could talk about the way church composers took remarkably profane songs um, from troubadours and jongleurs and turned them into some of the most famous music of the church. We love to talk about borrowing practices of well-known composers that you may have studied, practices which would certainly violate both today's copyright law and the Duke Law School honor code. Um, I'll present that to you in a single slide. Here's our homage to Super Mario Brothers, named Super Barrio Brothers after the composer um, Barrio. And here's our explanation of various accepted practices of musical borrowing engaged in by classical and romantic composers. We have arrangement, cantus firmus, parody, quotation, modeling, themes and variations, allusion. 
these practices were entirely accepted um, when Bach was writing, when Beethoven was writing, when Mozart was writing. Now, as I mentioned, they could probably violate both copyright law and the Duke Law Honor Code. Moving forward, let's listen to example. Did you guys recognize this? So the first is the French national anthem, the Marseillaise. The second is Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture, because of course he quoted the French national anthem repeatedly um, to signal the arrival of the French army in Russia. Um, the third is the Beatles using the Marseillaise in their style to symbolize international harmony. Perhaps they should have paid attention to the actual lyrics of the Marseillaise. Um, <laughs> As you'll see when we get to copyright law, those practices would be looked at askance by the music industry today, at least if the work being used was still under copyright protection. We're going to skip forward a bit because we're behind time. <coughs> Slide about the Beatles. More things we could talk about. Printing press and how it changed incentives. The transition from a patronage-oriented system to a market-based system. Changing focuses on the notion of originality and the entry of copyright law. but. We've got 2,000 years to cover, one lunch hour to do so. So in our remaining time, we're going to turn to America, the US, and focus on two stories. First, the way music became implicated in repeated attempts to police the color line in segregated America. And second, the question, is the musical commons that we've been showing so far now disappearing? Music is always built on itself in the United States and elsewhere, but is copyright law now trying to undermine that process? And could it succeed in doing so, succeed where Plato, churches, and segregationists have failed? Let's get to it. That's the only thing in this entire presentation that's arguably not a fair use. We thought we should have some infringement. I think it's a fair use. <laughs> we have debated this. Um, this is what we do at home. So um, we said before that the US is a remix nation. Um, how could it not be? Every culture that came here or was brought here brought their culture, and some of that culture was music. So there's a lot of reasons why the US had international reach in terms of its cultural impact, perhaps far beyond its size, some of them having to do with media, et cetera. But one of them is that it is a, a musical Madagascar, that it is the, the, the rainforest of the refrain, that it is the, the Galapagos of the G-string, not that kind of G-string. In any event, the United States is, and I'm really serious about this, precisely because of all of the peoples who come to make it up an area of musical mega biodiversity. And when they start to make their popular music, that will become apparent. So think of the cultural wealth of the music that was brought to this country, the grand traditions of European chamber and orchestral music, folk songs ranging from Eastern European to melancholy Celtic ballads, Spanish rhythms and dances from Spain's former colonies in the Americas, instrumentation from stringed instruments to the horns that would become Sousa's marching band to the humble Scottish bagpipe. And I have to I say this. Americans inexplicably seem to believe that the bagpipe is suitable for one occasion, namely graduation. <laughs> you can only get your sheepskin while listening to a man playing on what was once an actual sheep's stomach, which you may unkindly say sounds as though it was still attached to the sheep. Not really sure about that. Anyway, as I was saying, the rich cultural tradition, not all of those who came to this country did so voluntarily. African-American slaves brought African polyrhythms, the refrains which would become spirituals, and also instruments like the Acanting Spike Lute, which was one of the banjo's predecessors. Some Native American music made it into the mix, the Navajo's flute's plaintive melodies, 
And even in the New World Symphony, you can hear Dvorak trying to reflect the spirit of both African American and Native American um, melodies with his quotations. So the point was that the US was heir to the world's musical traditions. And when it set about forming a popular music from that rich mixture, that rich commons, it would create some of the country's most enduring contributions to culture. But not all of those contributions were positive. Jennifer mentioned that slaves had brought the accounting spike lute, the, the banjo precursor that you saw up there. For that and other contributions, uh, African Americans were honored by depictions such as these. Minstrelsy, uh, form of music known as Ethiopian at the time, based on flank, frankly racist stereotypes, enormously popular and enormously influential on American um, popular music. White performers in blackface performed catchy songs, uh, which often relied in part on a fusion of European tunes, African polyrhythms, uh, folk songs, um, all made together to make this very popular musical theater. Um, the demeaning portrayals were central to the actual um, art form itself. Um, and then uh, the final irony was that most of the people portraying these racist stereotypes were themselves actually white. Hashtag minstrels so white. Um, perhaps we should have a protest movement. Our book's not just about musical borrowing, but also about the uh, appreciation that musical borrowing can be cultural appropriation or just cultural slander. Um, one of the things that we thought about learning about minstrelsy was that it actually created stereotypes which made the reality of slavery seem far less brutal than it was. Um, there was a function to the music, not that it was only functional. Right? but it actually had cultural effects. Music is powerful for good and for ill. So, but American history is complex. This is Stephen Foster, uh, one of the greatest American popular composers of all time. Uh, oh, Susanna, Camptown Races, Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, My Old Kentucky Home. I mean, it just goes on and on. This guy wrote all of this astounding amount of music. Um, now, Foster clearly partly parlayed this Ethiopian minstrelsy tradition into success. And in that sense, he participated in its stereotypes. But he also wrote songs like Nellie Was a Lady. Nellie Was a Lady describes a grieving widower, probably not a widower because he was probably legally unable to marry his African-American bride, who is saying that his departed wife was an, a lady, even though she was seen as a second-class citizen, she had the virtues of those much higher in the social status. It was enormously popular and enormously tear-jerking. It actually took a series of racist stereotypes and partly turned them on their head in a humanizing way. This is what you get when you learn about musical culture. Stuff's complicated. Uh, doesn't mean you can't have moral feelings about it, but it's complex. It resists simplistic narratives. So music is powerful for good and for ill. And part of that power is the ability to inspire here. So fast forward 80 years, and America is in the mix of a new musical craze. I have to give a shout out to Professor Kelly here. He actually gave us this magazine, uh, which we're very grateful for. It's about the jazz problem. The jazz problem. <laughs> jazz is a classic American remix. African rhythms, often using the syncopation that had made ragtime so popular, where the stress is between the beats, not on them. The wind instruments from European band music, a culture of conspicuous virtuosity and improvisation, the use of discord and time signature changes. All of this was shocking to some parts of America's self-proclaimed cultural elite, but it was also shockingly popular at the same time. So this is the jazz problem. When you look inside, you will find some of these opinions of prominent public men and musicians. George Ady, the cruder form of jazz, a collection of squeals and squawks and wails against a concealed back structure of melody became unbearable to me soon after I began to hear it. Mrs. HHA Beach, who did break some gender barriers, but perhaps not other kinds of barriers. In association with some of the modern dancing and the sentiment of the verses in which many of the jazz songs are founded, it would be difficult to find a combination more vulgar or debasing. Now, Sousa fans out there, you can still cheer. Uh, back. Sorry. 
There's no reason with its exhilarating rhythm, its melod melodic ingenuities, why it should not become one of the accepted forms of composition. He was also just factually correct. Uh, jazz, of course, goes on to become one of the great American contributions to world culture. But not everyone was as accepting. Frank Damrosch, jazz, jazz is to real music what a caricature is to portrait. The jazz originated in the dance rhythms of the Negro. It was at least interesting that the self-expression of a primitive race when jazz was adopted by the highly civilized white race was tended to degenerate into toward primitivity. Damrosch, by the way, founded the musical institute that became Juilliard. Yeah. So we would like to think that views like this had been confined long ago to the shameful dustbin of history. Um, look at Damrosch's argument. Um, Races have cultures. Some races are superior to other races. When those cultures come together, a form of cultural miscegenation happens. This must be fought, fought by a kind of separatist movement. I had kind of thought when we started writing this, this is a history book. Not entirely given recent cultural events. And one of the reasons we wanted to dwell on this is a little bit of a wake-up call. This is a fully expressed ideology of paranoia about loss of a unitary culture, which is invaded by another culture that is powerful and somehow different and subversive. Those ideas have not gone away, I am very, very sad to say. So the Fuhrer of Jazz was <laughs> by no means the end of this argument. Um, in the 50s and 60s, oh, here, of course, we have to do this. We wonder, what will people be saying you know, today? Will people think of today's music, uh, today's controversial music, in the same way they thought about jazz back then? Your Honor, what I'm doing is really no different than what the esteemed Snoop Dogg or Little Wayne did in the early days of the 21st century. And by the way, we nailed Snoop Dogg there. We really did. <laughs> this is just this. You know, I did think that's a secret. Um, you dare compare yourself to a classical rapper. So. Um, so as I said, the furor didn't end at this period. Um, in the 50s and 60s, the battle over segregation wasn't just over lunch counters or water fountains or swimming pools or ballot boxes. It was also over music. This is Asa Carter, George Wallace's speech writer. He really did. That's a good picture of him. Rock and roll music is the basic heavy beat music. The Negro appears to the bass in man, brings out animalism and vulgarity. Notice same themes that Damrosch had conjured up. Um, he went on, comes from the heart of Africa where it was used to incite warriors to such a frenzy that by nightfall neighbors were cooked in carnage pots. Now this is genuinely a new one. I knew that rock and roll led to, you know, sex and drugs, but cannibalism I had not actually thought to go there. And this is, if you're going to be hysterical, be really, really pants on fire, screaming batshit insane hysterical. Um, and this went further. The NAACP was charged with using rock and roll subversively to penetrate the innocent minds of white teenagers, leading to both musical miscegenation, mixing of musical cultures, but also actual miscegenation, ritualistic orgies of erotic dancing. By the way, this is not a good way to discourage teenagers. <laughs> this is terrible, right? This is sort of like. This may make you cool and get you attractions by romantic partners. No, very, very bad. Um, white girls are recruited for colored lovers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, they may be Reds, left wingers, or hecklers of social convention. There's a few of, there's a few of those in the audience. I, uh, you know who you are. Um, so again, this seems crazy, silly, ridiculous, ludicrous. Remember that there were anti-miscegenation statutes on the books and being enforced in America into that most perfectly titled of US Supreme Court cases, Loving versus Virginia, which was decided in 1967. That's 50 years ago. Some of the people in this room were alive then. <laughs> That's horrifying, both the fact I was alive and the fact it was 1967. Utterly horrifying. So. You're probably feeling a little bit superior to all of this. It's like, wow, well, we're much smarter nowadays. We don't have this. Again, I would say recent events should lead us to not assume that all of these ideas have gone away. Art and music have power. And that was understood. This is Walter White, executive secretary of the NAACP. Rock and roll is a great race level or a tremendous instrument for bringing about a common ground for integration. This is the flip side, not trying to police music to keep people apart, but rather saying, hey, if you start listening to music, 
maybe you'll start to appreciate that the people who you have been holding at a distance, thinking of as the other, objectifying, are actually people. If you can get their hips to move, their minds will surely follow. So for all the story of this, isn't this just a story of the exploitation of African-American musicians? African-American musicians contributed enormously indeed the majority perhaps, of much of the background, certainly of the blues and much of rock and roll. And of course they didn't receive the benefits or the fame that was their due. Segregation denied them access to venues. Uh, they were, everyone was screwed by the record companies. They were screwed worse. Um, but to be fair, this was equal opportunity, terrible <laughs> recording contracts. Um, is this just a tale of crude expropriation in which white performers took black rhythms played them for white audiences, and then reaped the benefits, leaving the black musicians out in the cold. Definitely part of the story, but that denies something. First of all, it denies the agency of the African-American musicians involved, who were quite ingenious in negotiating this bar. Right? They didn't just say, I hear I am being oppressed. This is Little Richard. Um, you might say, wow, isn't that a little kind of gender bendy for like the 1960s? Yes, and that was on purpose. This is his explanation. By wearing this makeup, I could work and play white clubs, and the white people didn't mind the white girls screaming over me. They were willing to accept me because they figured I wouldn't be no harm. They were wrong, by the way. Um, <laughs> a fine time was had by all. So um, they also, it, it ignores counterexamples. Ray Charles, for example, incredibly savvy business person, kept all his own masters, you know, sort of owned these things. And it also ignores something else. It ignores the way that the process of musical fertilization and cross-fertilization was more uh, complicated. So um, as I said, everyone got screwed. Some people got screwed worse. This is Chuck Berry, probably one of the, the founders of rock and roll. This is Keith Richards and John Lennon. Um, if you tried to give rock and roll another name, I might call it Chuck Berry. Um, this was someone who deserved more credit than he got, but he was able to negotiate that space and um, get a fair degree of credit. So, a second reason. So the flow of the musical appropriation wasn't just in one direction. So tell me if you recognize this song. Everybody know this song? Catchy, huh? Yeah. Actually, you do kind of know this song. As I was motivating over the hill, I saw Maybelline in the coupe de ville. I got it like a rolling on an open road, nothing out of run my vehicle. It's Chuck Berry again. So the country dance is called Ida Red. Maybelline, that's Maybelline, was originally called Ida May. Ida Red, Ida May, similar rhythm in the background. Um, when Chuck Berry was invited to perform in Knoxville, he showed up at the venue and they said, oh, we, we thought it was a country dance that was going to be performed by a white band, but you're a black man, you can't come in here. And so he had to go back to his car and listen while a white band played his song, um, uh, Maybelline. So Chuck Berry took traditional country, a traditional country song, which in turn drew on Scottish and Irish predecessors, fusing it with the blues and inventing rock and roll. The cultural appropriation goes back and forth across the color line. Let's take another example. I'm sure you recognize this one. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. You may be unsurprised to learn that that song was originally recorded by Big Mama Thornton. Listen to her voice. You Except Hound Dog was written by these two guys, Lieber and Stoller, who were white for Big Mama, who was black. Lieber and Stoller wrote hundreds of famous songs, and they loved, 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 and honored rhythm and blues. And if you really want a good story, they have an autobiography where they talk about meeting Big Mama Thornton. It's a great story. Um, and then Elvis, borrowed from Big Mama Thornton, and added a little country, added a little rockabilly. So who's appropriation who in the story? More complicated than you might think. 
And what did black artists think about Elvis? Here's what the Reverend Al Green said. He broke the ice for all of us. And little Richard said of Elvis, he was an integrator. Elvis was a blessing. They wouldn't let black music through. He opened the door for black music. So we're not trying to deny the massive racial injustice in American music. Hopefully you pick that up a little bit. That's one of the reasons why we wrote the comic. We thought it's actually surprisingly under chronicles, and we wanted to get this into high schools and places where people would actually realize this is part of my history. Um, this has shaped the world that I live in. But we also don't want the story, that story crudely told, to, to, to drown out another one, which is, and this is optimistic, I think, the remarkable ability of art to undermine walls, to break down barriers, to subvert stereotypes. Again, to get hips and then eventually minds moving. Creativity in American music isn't a simple one-way process of appropriation, though that certainly happened. It's more like a sort of Salvador Dali game of hopscotch back and forth over a color line when the color line was there, which eventually blurs and sometimes makes that line disappear. So one of the things we learned, don't look to the past if you want simple truths. Then again, don't look to the present or the future. So now we turn to our theme of the final theme, the vanishing commons. Um, there's a question mark there. This, this, is, this is a question. As you've tried, as I've, we've tried to show you, one of the things about music is its remarkable ability to borrow from and build upon itself, standing on the shoulders of giants. Borrowing on, borrowing from, being influenced by prior works, different styles, different races, different cultures, different instruments. That's music's DNA, right? That's what it is. And every other prior generation of artists has pretty much taken for granted that they at least had the ability, they wouldn't have said the right, but I think that's what they would have thought, to take small portions, not entire songs, but small portions of other people's works to, to pick up a theme, a standard intro, a standard bass line, um, and to uh, use that bass line, to use that blues, to use uh, all of those things in order to uh, express their uh, future. So that was true. Is it true now? Our best legal judgment considered, not as said as hyperbole, is if we took the rules that are currently applied to rap and hip hop. And perhaps to all musical influence in today's at least commercialized world, not the world of the YouTube mashup, but the world of someone with a major record deal, that jazz and the blues would be impossible, simply impossible. That federal judges no jazz, they know it's respectable. They know in jazz you're allowed to grab other pieces. It doesn't look like theft there. They know that the 12 bar blues is a great American treasure. So they don't think, oh, those songs sound suspiciously similar. They don't think about that, about that, about that today. And increasingly, business cultures are not assuming that that is the case. A lot of this isn't about law, it's about practices of risk averse um, executives. So what about the law? Does, uh, we've seen rulers and popes and philosophers try and restrict musical borrowing. What's, what's the law going to do? So we're going to skip over. We had more music for you guys, but as usual, time's running out. Um, we had some 12-bar blues. We had more 12-bar blues. We can, we can, we got All right, 12-bar yeah, yeah. blues. All right. Um, so jazz is one classic form of American remix. So is blues and its offspring, soul, rock and roll. This is the great Robert Johnson, the source of the Nile, or in this case, perhaps the source of the Mississippi Delta. Uh, this is I Believe I Dust My Broom. I'm going to get up in the morning. I believe I dust my broom. I'm going to get up in the morning. I believe I dust my broom. So it's Robert Johnson's version of the 12 bar blues. Here's something a little different. Sounds different, but it's also built on the 12 bar blues. It's the first six bars. Here's a man, Chuck Berry again.
So those are all um, standard 145 chord sequences, 12 bar blues, the basis of a vast amount of American music. But they didn't just take standard chord sequences. They also took actual hooks, actual riffs, opening, uh, opening lines. So this is a test. You get all three correct, you win a book for free. <laughs> what are these three songs? <laughs> Anybody got it? And we got number one. Boogie Chillin' by John Lee Hooker. Anyone got number two? Come on. There's, there was some smiling over there. I think Neil and, and Joseph knew. That was ZZ Top's LaGrange. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. There you go. Go see. This is how you get to be a Duke Law professor. And the final one, Spirit in the Sky by Norman Greenbaum. These guys are going, we've never heard any of these things. Um, OK. So um, again, this was something where they assumed that that kind of stuff could be taken, could be used. And we can argue about that. Maybe, um, maybe John Lee Hooker got screwed by ZZ Top. You could certainly make that case. But listen to this example. So why are we concerned about the law? You may have heard about the Blurred Lines case that's currently on appeal in front of the Ninth Circuit. There's Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke. Here's Marvin Gaye's song, Gotta Give It Up. Blurred lines. There's certainly similarities. Party noises, a 70s funk groove, a cowbell. But that's because, um, by the way, more cowbell. Um, <laughs> cultural reference. Um, that's because, to quote the great Pharrell Williams, he was trying to channel that late 70s feeling. How are you going to channel that late 70s feeling without having some party noises and funky groove? Um, this case, somewhat notorious in the music, musical community and music industry, because a jury awarded the heirs of Marvin Gaye over $7.3 million for what seems essentially to amount to copying a style or a feel or a groove. The judge later reduced that verdict to a little over $5.3 million with 50% of future royalties. And they just had oral arguments in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, we will see how it comes out. OK, now we're going to give you another example. Clara Ward, Ray Charles. <laughs> Do you know that this little girl of mine? I want you people to know. So um, what Charles does is he basically invents an entirely new genre. The genre is called soul. Soul takes gospel on the one hand, Clara Ward. It then takes rhythm and blues. And it does something to the subject matter, too. Gospel was, after all, about divine adoration. Soul subjects erotic romantic adoration for divine adoration. It takes the object of religious adoration and turns it into the desired, the beloved. So this little light of mine becomes this little girl of mine. And as you can see, they were remarkably similar, right? The tunes were the same. The lyrical structure was the same. And people might have thought that was sacrilegious, but they didn't think that it was copying. Now, we can, again, argue moral rights, right? Was this a good result or a bad result? The point is, this is not the world of the blurred lines uh, uh, verdict or, and we're going to have to skip over this, but of a whole series of recent uh, decisions about sampling. Courts have, in brief, said, get a license or do not sample. Uh, one court argued that there is no de minimis in sampling, that um, what they are going to do in sampling is say, you should, uh, you should simply pay for every sample. No fair use, no, no um, none of the limitations and exceptions. Get a license or do not sample. We do not see this as stifling creativity in any way. Imagine applying that rule to jazz. We had a simple thesis. Anything that makes jazz and the blues illegal is dumb. Um, I'm willing to defend that thesis relatively, uh, relatively vigorously. So we were imagining this. 
So just to reiterate, the sampling cases said that you have to pay for anything more than one note digital sampling. That's regulating music down to the atomic level. Happy to say there's a circuit split. The Ninth Circuit has now disagreed with the Sixth Circuit on it, so we're watching it. But nevertheless, that rule is out there. And yeah, here's our imagining get a license or do not solo. Wouldn't work. So our conclusion. Um, we want to turn to the future of music. Um, that's how Chuck D feels about it. Yeah, Chuck D uh, <laughs> actually wrote a song about him being found liable for having sampled George Clinton a two-second uh, portion uh, of, a, of, of a George Clinton uh, uh, guitar solo, which he looped over and over again. It was completely undetectable. He didn't like it. Um, so, the future of music. Um, we've tried to tell you the story of the past. On the one hand, a festival of borrowing that goes back 2,000 years and more. On the other hand, a series of attempts to regulate that borrowing for philosophical reasons, for religious reasons, um, for reasons of aesthetics, um, for reasons of law. Um, and so maybe the prior attempts which failed are precursors of this attempt, the attempt now to do through law what segregation and other things uh, could not achieve. There's the prior people who tried to remix, stop remixing masses, races, the jazz problem, etc. They didn't win. Maybe music is simply powerful enough that it will resist this turn too. So on the other hand, we have some doubts. We have some doubts because the thing is, we could make this argument to you because you knew what blues and jazz and rock and roll were, but if you didn't have those things, how could we tell you that you had missed them? What might we not have that we don't know we never had? That's the thing that caused us to write this book. Nevertheless, we have an optimistic side, um, and the optimistic side is that the staff of music is long, but it bends towards harmony. <laughs> Again, remixing a quote that Obama <laughs> paraphrasing an abolitionist, and with our late friend Keith Aoki, Aoki. hanging out on the moon with, with the late David, David Bowie. Bowie. Which is definitely where Keith is, on the moon with David Bowie. There's just no doubt in our mind that's where he would be. So we're going to end and let the comic say the final words, because after all, this is a comic book. Thank you. Thank you.